Hey everyone, CJ here. Welcome to the Water Margin Summarized series. Water Margin is one among the four great classical Chinese novels, but it is also the most violent, gory, and immoral among all of them. The tone of this novel is much closer to The Sopranos instead of Robin Hood and His Merry Men. That's why it had been banned many times across multiple Chinese dynasties and various modern adaptations have whitewashed the story too, adding more justification for the wanton killings and the leading scenes of cannibalism. But for this series, I will preserve all the gory scenes of the original text though I will spare the details to adhere to YouTube's terms of service. Along the way, I will also explain the historical and cultural context of the plot so that we can learn more about life in Song Dynasty China. On another note, if you are interested in writing wuxia stories or other stories set in medieval China, as long as you use this novel as guideline, the setting would look passably convincing. Even though there are some anachronism, since the story was written around the Ming Dynasty, about 300 years after the setting of the novel. By the way, before I start, take a look at these cool shirts and merch for the series. These Chinese characters say, Si hai zi nei, jie xiong di. Within the four seas, all men are brothers. A slogan commonly used in this novel. Creating this series takes a lot of resources and labor, so our team would really appreciate it if you show us some support by getting these cool merch from the link below. Alternatively, you can also support us on Patreon or make one of donations by using the Super Thanks button or coffee. Anyway, without any further ado, let's start the series. Water Margin is set during the Song Dynasty, which lasted from the year 960 to 1279. This dynasty rose from the chaotic Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period, which followed the fall of the Golden Age of Tang Dynasty. Song Dynasty was a period of contradictions. Despite being smaller than other dynasties, it was one of China's most prosperous eras. Culture and commerce flourished at the expense of the military, Yet, it was also mired by constant warfare against their powerful Khitan and Jurchen neighbors. I covered all this information in greater detail in previous videos, so check them out if you need more context. The first chapter of Water Margin starts a few decades before the appearance of the outlaws, in 1058, during the reign of the kind and merciful emperor Renzong. At the time, the empire suffered from terrible waves of plagues, they tried to alleviate this by reducing prison sentences and temporarily abolishing taxes. But nothing they did seemed to help this crisis. So the good and capable minister Fan Zongyin suggested that they invite a Taoist master with divine power to come to the palace to perform a ritual to appease the heavens. The suggestion was accepted by the emperor, and soon enough, Hong Xing was sent to the Dragon Tiger Mountain in Jiangxi one of the four secret mountains of Taoism, in search of the celestial master, Zhang. Water Margin loves to name drop historical figures, especially in the earlier chapters, but the characters are mostly fictional. To help you identify which ones are historical, I will mark their nameplates as you have seen before. After spending a night at the Sangqing Temple, fasting and cleansing himself, he was sent by the Taoist acolytes to seek their master up the mountains. Along the way, he encountered a tiger and then a snake, which scared the loving wits out of him. But they were really just tests for his sincerity. As the marshal grumbled at the indignities he suffered, he suddenly saw a lone young boy on this treacherous mountain. The boy said, This morning, Celestial Master Zhang told me he had predicted that the emperor had sent an envoy to invite him to perform a ritual at the palace. So he had already started his journey to the capital, riding on his crane and cloud. What? So I climbed all the way up here for nothing? By the time the marshal returned to the temple, he was tired and in a foul mood. When he told the Taoist monks what had happened to him, they assured him that the boy was actually their celestial master, who was a prodigy at transformation and many esoteric arts. If he said that he's already on his way, then his mission was as good as accomplished. Ah, oh, whatever. Since his job was done anyway, on the next day, Marshal Hong 
took the opportunity to tour the temple. Then he came across a hall that had been sealed away for generations of celestial masters. Hall of the Vanquished Demons. Curious, he ordered the Taoists to open the door to the hall. They tried to dissuade him, telling him that many demons were sealed in it and it would bring calamity to humanity if they are released. But nah, he is not going to fall for another one of those tricky Taoist scams. So he pulled ranks as Imperial Envoy to command them to open it. Inside the hall, he found a tablet with its lower part half buried in the ground, and the words for Hong to open was engraved behind it. Hey, this might be my destiny. He didn't know what was going on, but maybe something good will come out of it, he thought. So he ordered the workers to dig the tablet up amidst the protestation of the Taoists. And would you be surprised if a demonic screech suddenly emerged from the abyss under the tablet and black smoke burst through the temple roof? The bumbling fool who released an ancient curse trope seemed to be universal among many cultures' literary tropes. Anyway, when the smoke reached the middle of the sky, it burst into many rays of golden light, dispersing the spirits of the 36 heavenly stars and 72 earthly stars, 108 demons altogether. This, my friends, is the origin of the dispersing MacGuffin trope used in various East Asian literature. It is also used in Nanto Satomi Hakenden, a Japanese epic inspired by Water Margin. As discussed in the previous episode, Water Margin pronounced as Suikoden in Japanese, was very influential in the developments of early modern Japanese literature. In terms of Chinese literature, here we can see a great example of reverse isekai. Gods, demons, or other divine beings reincarnated into human is a common Chinese literature trope. But this doesn't necessarily give them any special powers. The 108 outlaws who will be reincarnated from these demons are relatively normal people. But the balance between good and bad karma from their previous lives dictates the direction of their fate. They will have to try to end this cycle of violence or they will be doomed to repeat it in another. But let me tell you, Water Margin is not a story about gods and devils. It is really a story about men and the temptation for violence and destruction despite their attempts to live a just life. Being a Hao Han, manly, righteous men. In another Chinese classical novel, Dream of the Red Chamber, which is also known as the Story of the Stone, the heroine Ling Daiyu owes the main character Jia Boyu a debt of tear from their previous lives as flower and magical stone. They don't have special powers, but she is destined to return this debt with her own tears, living a life full of tragedies. This first chapter of Water Margin serves as a Xie zi, or a wedge. In Chinese literature, Xie zi may not be directly related to the main plot, but it foreshadows the general arc of the story. The country may be ruled by a good emperor and talented ministers, but the foolish action of irresponsible officials may be the inciting point of a butterfly effect that started a thunderstorm far down the line. Anyway, going back to the story, by the time Marshal Hong returned to the palace, the Celestial Master had finished performed his ritual and ended the plague. Since everything seemed to be okay, he didn't lodge any report about the demons he had unleashed. And nothing happened for the next few decades. The story then skipped years ahead to sometime before the 1100s. Here we meet one of the central antagonists of the story, Ko Chiu. He was a ruffian with low morals and a professional toady who latches onto rich and influential people and trading one master after another to achieve a higher rank. His one and only talent is playing Chinese football. As he hustled his way up the social ladder in the capital of Song Dynasty, Bianliang, also known as Kaifeng, by chance he met the emperor's brother while doing a delivery for his master. As if the stars on heaven aligned for him, the ball the prince was playing with rolled right before his feet. Well, he can't waste this chance, can he? So he showed his football skill to the prince. He performed his Mandarin Duck Turn Kick. This is perhaps the earliest depiction of a special sports move in fiction. 
and it might be the predecessor of those sports mangas. With that one kick, he delivered the ball right back to the prince and made a great impression. Hey, do you play ball? Not long after, the prince's brother, Emperor Zhezong, died. And since the former emperor had no heir, the prince was elevated to be Emperor Huizong. Obviously, Kaochiu also profited greatly from this, and he was fast-tracked to become a Grand Marshal. Historically, Emperor Huizong was a great painter, poet, and calligrapher, and also a Taoist master. But he just didn't have the knack to be a great ruler, so this terrible decision was quite accurate to his character. As Grand Marshal, Kaochiu started to flaunt his power and made sure everyone below him know their place. Wang Jing, the martial arts instructor of 800,000 Imperial Army, soon entered his radar. His offense was failing to turn up on the first day Kaochiu took office and took a few days off. Sick? I don't believe it! I know your father! He was a street performer and a snake oil salesman! Guards, teach him a lesson! Luckily for Wang Jing, the guards were on good terms with him and pleaded for the marshal to forgive the instructor. Eventually, Ko Chou decided to drop the matter, but Wang Jing knew that his future under Ko Chou will be unbearable because his father used to be Ko Chou's martial arts teacher and had trashed this scum years ago. Ko Chou won't be satisfied until he get his revenge. So he quietly left the post and brought his sickly mother with him. Like his predecessor, Hong Xing, Ko Chou's action became a flap of the butterfly's wing that would spin into the main narrative. Wang Jing is just a side character, but through his travel to the western frontiers, where he won't be recognized by Ko Chou's goon, we are soon introduced to the first star of destiny. As Wang Jing's mother's health deteriorated, they were fortunate enough to be given a place to stay in the manner of a kindly old man in Huaying district. On the next day, as Wang Jing was ready to depart, he chanced upon a young man practicing with his staff in the courtyard. He had nine blue dragons tattooed all over his body. His name was Si Jing, nicknamed the Nine Tattooed Dragon, the first star of destiny to make an appearance and ranked 23rd among the 108 stars. You will the stick well, but there are gaps in your techniques. You can't beat a real man with that. Obviously, the young man was furious when he heard this. The lord of the manor quickly apologized for his son and told him to behave. But the young man will have none of it, so he challenged the rude guest to a fight and quickly learned why Wang Jing was made the martial arts instructor of the Imperial Guards. Realizing that he had much more to learn, he cowed out and begged Wang Jing to be his master. Wang Jing accepted so he stayed with the Si family for the next six months, teaching his new students the mastery of the 18 weapons. 18 weapons means complete set of weaponry. Through the different dynasties, the list of the 18 weapons, which commonly includes spear, axe, sword, bows, and so on, may change, and the list used by the military and civilians may be different. But whenever you heard the literary use of this term, it means that someone had mastered all the weapons. With his disciples' training complete, Master Wang Jing took his leave to continue his journey with his mother westward to Yan'an. Narrative-wise, Wang Jing had accomplished his purpose and we won't see him again. Not long after, Si Jing's father died and the young man became the lord of the manor. Since he wasn't really interested in farming, the manor was poorly managed. As for fighting, however, that's what he is all about. That's why, when the news of a group of bandits having encamped in the nearby Mount Sohua, he got excited. He organized a militia and eagerly awaited their arrival. And soon enough, one of the bandit chiefs, Chen Da, launched a raid against the village. He had also heard of rumors about some tough guy named Si Jing guarding Huaying village. So he will pay him a visit to size him up. When Chen Da came face to face with Si Jing, he pretended that he was just seeking passage, wanting to go to the other side of the village. Come on, within the four seas, all men are brothers. Do your bro a solid and let me pass, will ya? Si Jing will have none of it. So inevitably, they fought. 
and after a long struggle, Si Jing emerged victorious. This bandit happened to be pretty tough himself, and as it turned out, he was one of the stars of destiny himself, Chen Da, the stream leaping tiger. His two sworn brothers then quickly made their appearance too, Yang Chun, the white flower serpent, and Zhu Wu, the resourceful strategist. Together, they are unofficially known as the knockoff Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei. You know, 108 is quite a big roster, so you're bound to find some reused characters among them. As sworn brothers, even if they are not born together, they will die together, they said. If Si Jing is going to send Chen Da to the authorities, then they will share the same fate. Moved by this manly display of manly brotherhood, Si Jing decided to let them go. Ha ha, it worked, Zhu Wu said. Begging for mercy was actually his brilliant strategy. Yeah, I know, it's kind of lame. That's why they are part of the 72 earthly stars. The earthly stars are usually the supporting characters of the story. Despite their crocodile tears, they had to admit that Si Jing was being very manly. So they ended up becoming true friends and kept in contact by exchanging gifts and letters. Associating with bandits and outlaws, however, was a grave offense. So they had to keep their friendship a secret. Unfortunate for them, one day, when Si Jing was inviting them to his manor to celebrate the Mid-Autumn Festival, his bumbling servants dropped their letter and lied about losing it. So on the night of the festival, the sheriff and his men surrounded the manor ready to arrest everyone. Apparently, the letter had fallen into the wrong hand, and Si Jing's life was practically ruined. He will forever be associated with the outlaws. So he killed his lying servants and burned his home before clearing a path out of his manor with weapons spinning. He killed the officers in the melee too, so there is no more turning back. Once they have made their escape, the brothers begged him to stay with them. But he politely declined, opting to go west to Yan'an to find his master. Besides, he's got to pass the narrative torch to another main character. Before he reached Yan'an, he made a stop at Weizhou to ask if anybody had seen his master. This is where we meet the next main character of the story, Lu Zisen, the flowery monk. But he is not quite a monk yet at this point. Of course I've heard of Instructor Wang Jing. Sadly, he's not here. But I've also heard about you, the Nine Tattooed Dragon or something, yeah? Haha, <laughs> come on, let's drink! On their way to the tavern, Si Jing coincidentally met his earliest martial arts master, Li Zhong, the Tiger Slaying General, who also happened to be a star of destiny, performing martial arts tricks and peddling suspicious medicines. Look, a lot of these nicknames are exaggerations, okay? It is practically inconceivable that someone like Li Zong could ever do something like killing a tiger. You know him? Great! The more the merrier! Bring him along! We will all drink together! <laughs> on the next episode, our focus will be on the flowery monk Lu Zisen and panzer hat Lin Chong. I will also talk about what is worse than eating dogs in medieval China and what happened to criminals in Song Dynasty. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss it. Also, remember that we've got great t-shirts and merch you can get to support this channel. Before I go, I would like to thank our patrons at Patreon for making this series possible. Until next time, stay cool my bros!